The ISIS Papers, Chapter 2 The Origin of Alienation, Anxiety, and Narcissism Dedication This essay is dedicated to Genevieve Akate, a Nigerian journalist who, because of the profound pain of alienation, took her life on June 25, 1978, while residing in the United States of America. The world lost a brilliant mind and a generous person. Shortly before her death, she stated, My superstructure is solid. I need a formidable foundation. This essay is my contribution to our understanding of the destructive dynamic of alienation. Psychiatry as a discipline is floundering on its pre previously established conceptual and theoretical foundation imported from 19th century Europe. My continuing question to myself as a late 20th century precautionary in general and child psychiatry practicing in the power capital of the world, Washington, D.C., is can a greater understanding be achieved in the study of human behavior as it is organized and manifested in the world's dominant power system culture? My answer is affirmative. We can derive an ever-increasing level of order out of, the, out of the existing chaos, a diagnostic and statistical man manual that gets heavier and wordier with e each effort. Thereby, we can enhance our diagnostic and treatment skills and increase the possibility of prevention, allowing us to serve a suffering humanity better. In Have Astronomers Found God, Robert Jastro states, there's a kind of religion in science. It is the religion of a person who believes there is order and harmony in the universe. And every event can be explained in a rational way as the product of some previous event. Every effort must have its cause. Jastro continues taking a quotation from Albert Einstein. The scientist is possessed by the sense of universal causation. As a social and behavioral scientist, I'm convinced it is possible to understand in depth the patterns and systems of behavior encountered in the individual and in the broad collective. My further conviction is that we can serve humankind maximally as behavioral scientists and physicians only when we adequately ad analyze the fundamental causation and logic of these patterns of behavior. Three major focus of attention in Western social and behavioral science, particularly in psychiatry, Alienation, anxiety, and narcissism are not unrelated, isolated syndrome abstractions as they have been discussed by Western social and behavioral scientists. These separately described phenomena are not only interrelated, but they have a common origin and cause. They are derivatives of the same casual dynamic. Although that casual dynamic has remained unidentified, the source of these three phenomena and the origin of Western civilization itself, alienation, in a color confrontation theory, I stated that racism, white supremacy, having begun as a form of alienation towards the self, now has evolved into the most highly refined form of alienation towards others as well. The color confrontation theory views all of the present battlegrounds in the world today as vivid reflections of this alienation towards others. The destructive and aggressive behavior patterns displayed throughout the world by white peoples toward all non-white peoples is the evidence of an inner hate hostility and rejection they feel towards themselves and of the deep self alienation that has evolved from their genetic inadequacy. My extended definition of alienation centers around the recognition that it is a fundamental behavioral dynamic in Western civilization and culture. Alienation is a powerful centrifugal genetic, psychological and societal dynamic that over time drives human beings further and further away from all effective, meaningful, emotional, supportive, and truthful communications amongst each other. The alienation dynamic increasingly forces people away from one another as Western civilization and culture evolves, as seen through each successive generation since its origin, including Greek civilization and the Roman Empire. Alienation is the very same dynamic that pushes human beings away from respectful and harmonious relationships with the physical environment, leading to the pollution and destruction of the planet. Most important, the alienation dynamic forces the individual away from all manifestations of self-understanding and self-respect, including the most fundamental respect, the respect for one's genetic makeup. The Encyclopedia Britannica records that the roots of the idea of alienation are found in the works of Platonius, a Roman philosopher born in Egypt who lived up between 205 and 270 AD, as well as in the, the theology of both St. Augustine and Martin Luther. The latter addressed the struggle to alienate oneself from one's own imperfections by identification with a transcendental perfect being. Entries on alienation did not appear in major reference books of the social sciences until 1935. But the concept of alienation was present in classical sociological texts of the 19th and early 20th centuries in the works of Marx, 
Durkheim, Tonys, Weber, and Simo. Eric and Mary Jof Jos Josephson in The Man Alone, alienation in modern society had the following to say about alienation. Indeed, ever since the great technological and political revolutions of the late 18th century, with their shattering impact on a rigid social order and a promise of individual freedom, one of the most disturbing phenomena in Western culture has been man's sense of estrangement from the world he himself has made or inherited. In a word, man's alienation from himself and from others. This theme of alienation of modern man runs through the literature and drama of two continents. It can be traced in the continent as well as the form of modern art. It preoccupies theologians and philosophers and to many psycho psychologists and sociologists is the central problem of our time. In various ways, they tell us that ties have snapped that formerly bound Western man to himself and to the world about him. In diverse language, they say that man in modern industrial societies is rapidly becoming detached from nature, from his old gods, from the technology that has transformed his environment and now threatens to destroy it, from his work and its products, and from his leisure, from the complex social institutions and presumably serve but are more likely to manipulate him, from the community in which he lives, and above all, from himself, from his body of, and his sex, from his feelings of love and tenderness, and from his art, his creative and productive potential. Contemporary contributors to the definition of alienation include such thinkers as psychoanalyst Eric Fromm, philosophers Louis Mumford and Herbert Marcuse, existentialists John Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, Paul Tillich, and Martin Buber, and sociologists David Reisman, Robert K. Merton, and Talcott Parsons. In summary, there are at least five casual theories concerning alienation. The economic, the technological, the sociological, and the philosophic, existential, and the psychological. Karl Marx is identified with the economic theory. Marx viewed alienation as a result of the private ownership of the means of production and expropriation of a man's labor by the capitalists, resulting in worker exploitation and class struggle, money and commodities becoming the most meaningful things in man's existence, and thus man's alienation from man. Technological theories attribute alienation to man's adjusted lifestyle to machines and automation. So sociological theories view the decline of the limited local community and emergence of mass society and a simultaneous increasing sense of individual powerlessness as the cause of alienation. Philosophic existential theories emphasize that alienation is inherent in the finite, finite and isolated character of man's existence as a stranger and an alien in the world. Psychologic theories are dominated by the views of Sigmund Freud, who viewed alienation or self-estrangement as a resultant of the split between the unconscious and the conscious forces in the personality, the individual thus being out of touch in the sense that repressed and unacknowledged desires motivate his behavior. More specifically, Freud pinpointed the Oedipal conflict and the frustrations inherited in civilized society as expressing the civilization and its discontents as a source of alienation. The following are but a few items from a long list of suggested manifestations of alienation. Child abuse, psychosis, suicide, neurotic depression, delinquency, psychosomatic disorders, prejudice, civil riots, wild cat strikes, and the rise of fascism. All are believed to have derived from one or more of the following states. So social isolation, self-estrangement, a sense of powerlessness, meaninglessness, normalnessness, and cultural estrangement. Whereas I agree with the existence of an alien, alien nation dynamic in Western civilization and culture, I disagree with all of the aforementioned theories of its causation. These theories remain superficial in their analysis as each fails to reach the core of the origin of Western civilization. The multiplicity of theories on such a basic and pervasive dynamic as alienation reflects the failure to comprehend the origin and nature of Western man who has created at conscious and unconscious levels the totality of the Western cultural imperative. With a sufficiency and a sufficiently deep investigation, the myriad aspects of the alienation dynamic that on the surface appear unconnected are recognized as highly interrelated and tied to a central core, a unitary causation. Anxiety and narcissism are tied to that same fundamental core as illustrated in the following diagram. The three-dimensional cone shape figure represents the multiple levels at which reality phenomenon may be decoded. The dots on the surface at level five represent the seemingly isolated multiple phenomenon that can be examined at every increasing level of depth. 
indicated by levels four through one. The basic interconnections between the isolated phenomena are less apparent at level five than at level two or level one, and the interconnections, however, become increasingly clear as a greater depth of phenomena penetration is achieved. The term Western means white. Western has become a comfortable and for some confusing obfuscation at euphemism or code for the word white. The terms Western civilization and Western culture specifically refer to the civilization and culture evolved, determined, directed, developed, and controlled by people who classify themselves as white. As mentioned in the color confrontation theory, white skinned people who lack any substantial level of permanent melanin in their skin historically have contrasted themselves with all people in the world who have substantial, recognizable, and permanent levels of melanin. These skin pigmented persons are referred to by white people to whites as non-white people or when they are subdivided by the whites, they're referred to as black, brown, red, and yellow people. Non-white people collectively constitute the global numerical majority. The skin pigmented global majority is genetically dominant to the genetically recessive whites, and genetically, they can annihilate the whites. These facts are essential to a thorough understanding of not only alienation, but anxiety and narcissism as well. One cannot comprehend alienation, anxiety, and narcissism as a major phenomenon in Western civilization and culture without an understanding of the origin of white-skinned people and their evolved thoughts and feelings, conscious and unconscious, about themselves. White skin is a form of albinism. There is no difference, microscopically speaking, between the white skin of a white person and the skin of a person designated as an albino. My central thesis here is that the white skinned peoples came into existence thousands of years ago as the albino mutant offsprings of black skinned mothers and fathers in Africa. A sizable number of these black parents had produced, rejected, and then cast out of the community their genetic defective albino offspring to live away from the normal black skinned pigmented population with the awareness of their rejection and alienation, as in leper colonies. The white tribe's eventual migration northward to escape the intensity of the equatorial sun of the southern hemisphere left the albinos eventually situated in an area of the world known as Europe, now recognized as the home of the white tribes. This early rejection of the albino offspring might be viewed as a prehistoric, pre-Western civilization instance of parental rejection, child neglect, and abuse. Sexual intercourse between the isolated albino mutants produced a white race, understanding race as an isolated population sharing a significant number of common identifying genes. This pattern of isolation, individ isolating individuals with defective genetic patterns is no different than the present day practice of placing genetically abnormal individuals in institutions away from the normal population group. Another current practice is the isolation of those who are genetically different into ghettos which is an exact parallel to the albino isolation. Support for my position is found in an article entitled Albinism by Carl Whitcop Jr. in a 1975 issue of Natural History magazine. Historically, people with various pigmenting conditions, including albinism, have occupied a spectrum of social positions ranging from outcasts to semi-gods. Montezuma, emperor of the Aztecs at the time of Cortez's conquest, maintained a museum of living human biological curiosities. Prominent among these people were numerous albinos, peoples with leprosy, which frequently causes spotty pigmentation of the skin and hair, are described in biblical literature as the lowest outcasts. Among the San Blas, albinos are semi-outcasts. They participate less in daytime tribal activity and are not permitted to marry. Biological investigations show that as a group, they are somewhat smaller and their muscles are not as well developed as those pigmented Samblas. Similarly, in his article entitled Kuna Moonchild Albinism in the Journal of Hereditary Heredity, Clyde Keeler notes among other findings on albinism. The voice quality of albino males is soft and higher pitched than in moreno or normal brown males. In addition, they appear to be deficient in male sex hormone. And while they had, may be fertile, they have a lower phallic posture due to flaccidity. Albinos usually have flabby muscles and reduced muscular strength as shown by manometer readings. Psychiatric examination of six albinos showed their work to be generally in an intellectual sphere where over, overcompensation is the rule. Religion serves as a major supporter for many albinos who take a 
fatalistic view of life and blame their failures on their albinism, which is God's will. As a usual thing, sexual experience is much more limited in the albinos, who until recently were not allowed to marry. While albino males have the reputation of being weakly sexed, albino females are said to be as active sexually as morenos, and they frequently have illegitimate children. It should be noted that many of the sandblast albinos were indistinguishable from the Scandinavians or other Northern Europeans. The 19th century German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, made the following statement about white skin in the philosophy of Schopenhauer, Metaphysics of Love and Sexes, which illuminates both Whitcop's and Keller's findings. The white color of skin is not natural to man, but that by nature, he has a black and brown skin, like our forefathers, the Hindus, that consequently a white man has never originally sprung from the womb of nature, and that thus there is no such thing as a white race, as much as this is talked of, but every white man is a faded or bleached one. Additional support is found in the work of Dr. Sheikh Antadia, the highly respected Senegalese anthropologist and Egyptologist, founder of the Radiocarbon Institute at the Fundamental Institute of Black Africa in Dakar, Senegal. Dr. Diop, in an interview in the winter 1976 issue of Black Books Bulletin, stated, There is absolutely no doubt the white race which appeared for the first time during the Upper Paleolithic, around 20,000 BC, was the product of a process de depigmentation. Further, Dr. Diop informs us that much later the whites commenced their migratory movements towards the southern areas around 1500 BC. Therefore, it should not be surprising that deep within the historic and current mythological and symbolism of Western civilization and culture, white supremacy system culture is evidence to strongly support the, abo the above outlined mode of origin as that actually traversed by the global albino or white collective. Matter on the streets each day Major evidence for this theory of albinism or whiteness is found in the symbolism of the Adam and Eve biblical mythology. Western civilization looks to this mythology in the book of Genesis as the account of its beginning. The essential elements of the Adam and Eve theory and story are that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, ate the forbidden fruit, the apple, had sexual intercourse, became ashamed of their nakedness, and were chased from the Garden of Eden. My decoding of that fundamental mythology and symbolism for Western civilization is as follows. Adam and Eve are the symbolic figures of the early albino mutants produced by black parents. The Garden of Eden is Africa, the place where all knowledgeable anthropologists and paleontologists are informing us that human life began and that the first human beings were black skinned. The apple eaten by Adam and Eve is the presumed orally ingested poison looked upon as the cause of the mutation to albinism. This ingestion was followed by the act of sexual intercourse, which is also viewed as being, being responsible for the mutation to albinism and therefore the original sin. Adam and Eve's shame for their nakedness indicates their rejection and shame of their pale white bodies, colorless or naked, when compared to the black and brown skin normals. Their use of a fig leaf to cover their genitals as they are depicted implies a shame and rejection of their genital apparatus, including their genes. Their expulsion from the Garden of Eden represents the isolation of the albino mutants away from the skin pigmented normals and their voluntary or involuntary migration out of Africa northward into Europe. Western culture goes further in the symbolism of its religious philosophy to pinpoint the eating of the apple by Adam and Eve followed by their act of sexual intercourse as their act of original sin. Because of this act, Western culture conceives of all its people as being born in sin and in need of being born again. Similarly, there are several other biblical references to skin color change through God's punishment and leprosy, wherein the skin is described as becoming white as snow in 2 Kings 5.27. Of course, the further implication is that the skin originally must have been black, meaning melanin pigmented. Otherwise, how could it turn white? Numbers 12.10 states, And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Contrary to the Western philosophy, there are no accounts of skin pigmented peoples in their basic religious and or philosophical text. 
conceiving of themselves as being born in sin or viewing their genital apparatus and therefore their genes as the basis of sin and evil. Further Western civilizations, religious and secular philosophy pinpoints the activity of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden as the point of the fall of man. The fall is the symbolic expression of the genetic mutation to albinism and the negative projections regarding the white skin self in the global population where the norm was black or brown skin color. Likewise, today, the modern science of genetics views most spontaneous mutations as negative and del deleterious in terms of the warfare of the organism and the environment, at least in the human population. Additional symbolism in Western civilization and culture lends further support to this thesis. For example, the dog, rather than God, proverbially is considered Western man's best friend. This is contrary to the beliefs of skin pigmented people regarding their relationship to God. This Western concept of the dog as man's best friend is linked to the mythology of the founding of Rome. According to this mythology, Rome was founded by two orphans, Romulus and Remus who were suckled by a wolf. Both of the wolf and the dog are canines. These two presumably white infants are said to have founded the state that began Western civilization and culture. When this is decoded, Romulus and Remus are the symbolic representatives of the early albinos who were abandoned by their black mothers in Africa as genetic mutant defectives and in the process of their northward migration for survival were left to the dogs suckled by wolves. This decoding explains the worship and love of the dog or canine in Western civilization. Western man's affection for the dog is reflected in the fact that in 1978 in New York City, dogs were permitted to put 250,000 pounds of fecal matter on the streets each day, defiling the environment for human beings. And is this love and worship of the dog reflective in the mirror image of the words God and dog? even at this advanced stage in the expression of the evolution of Western civilization and culture. Further, as relationships among people became more alienated, Western peoples are, and these non-white peoples have had, have been influenced most heavily by Western culture, are gaining more satisfaction from feeding, clothing, loving, and kissing canines than in feeding, clothing, loving, and kissing human beings. Western civilization's original symbolized relationship to the canine following the African black mother's rejection to the albino mutant offsprings undoubtedly has influenced the frequent use of the cursing expression, bitch, and son of a bitch. These degrading expressions are used pejoratively because deep within the unconscious Western or white albino psyche, the rejected mutant status is viewed pejoratively in a world where the human norm is to have hue. Greater insight into the sense of alienation in Western culture is provided by the use of the word mammy when whites refer to the black female caretaker while referring to the white female caretaker as nanny. Clearly, nanny is something less than mammy. Also, the words uncle and auntie used by whites toward blacks bespeak an unconscious awareness of a deep and ancient familial relationship. Disrupted relationships is the origin of alienation as supported by the symbolic rituals of Western fraternal organizations such as the Masons and Greek fraternities and sororities. The acting out of the crossing of the burning sands gives reference to the albino mutants expulsion from Africa across the burning sands of the Sahara Desert out of Africa and into Europe. This was the original alienation experience of the albino whites first spawned in Africa. From a more recent literary work than the Bible, the famous 19th century novelist Herman Melville and his profoundly symbolic work about the white supremacy system culture, Moby Dick, states, What is it that in the albino man so peculiarly repels and often shocks the eye, as that sometimes he is loathed by his own kith and kin? It is the whiteness which invests him, a thing expressed by the name he bears. The albino is as well made as other men has no substantive deformity, and yet this mere aspect of all pervading whiteness makes him more strangely hideous than the ugliest abortion. Why should this be so? Another famous American author, Mark Twain, in a collection of articles entitled Mark Twain on a Damned Human Race, compliments Melville's assessment in his essay, Skin Deep. Twain's analysis suggests that the depth of alienation experienced by whites, albinos, nearly all black and brown skins are beautiful but a beautiful white skin is rare. 
How rare one may learn by walking down a street in Paris, New York, or London on a weekday, particularly an unfashionable street, and keeping count of the satisfactory complexions encounters in the course of one mile, where dark complexions are masked, they make the whites look bleached out, unwholesome, and sometimes, frankly, ghastly. I could notice this as a boy, down south in the slavery days before the war. The splendid black satin skins of the South African Zulus in Durban seem to me to, be, to come very close to perfection. I can see those Zulus yet, handsome and intensely black creatures, moderately clothed on loose summer stuffs, whose snowy whiteness made the black all the blacker by contrast. Keeping the group in mind, I compare those complexions with the white ones which are streaming past this London window now. Twain continues detailing the negative attributes of white skin. The advantage is with the Zulu, I think. He starts with a beautiful complexion and it will last him through. And as for the Indian, brown, firm, smooth, blemishless, pleasant and restful to the eye, afraid of no color, harmonizing with all colors and adding grace to them all. I think there is no sort of chance for the average white complexion against that rich and perfect tint. Finally, major documentation in Western literary symbolism that explains the origin of the global white collective's alienation and unconscious awareness of this fact is the stark symbolism of the profoundly imp important work of Edgar Rice Burroughs, the author of the Tarzan series. The first of this series, Tarzan of the Apes, was copyrighted in 1912 and published in 1914. Before Burroughs died in 1950, he had produced 26 Tarzan books. So significant is the Tarzan symbolism for Western civilization and culture that Burroughs' company remains a multi-million dollar industry worldwide.